Ladies and gentlemen, today we are covering Season 7, Episode 1, The Bad Batch of uh, the show that we're watching, which is Clone Wars, Clone Wars Season 7. It has been, it's been a minute. For those of you not aware, uh, yeah, exactly. For those of you not aware, it has been seven years and five months since Season 6 came out into Season 7. Hell of a, hell of a gap, which makes sense. Season 7 wasn't really originally planned. Originally, season six was it, uh, ending with some interesting and rather well done story arcs. Can I just say I really I've, I've missed Clone Wars. I've missed Clone Wars. It's, it, but at the same time, for those of you who are watching this on the VODs or you know weeks from now, it's really weird going through this immediately after watching a show of the level of quality that Arcane is. Cause, wow, <laughs> you know. Just, oh my god. That is a jump down in quality. I'm sure most shows are a jump down in quality from Arcane. Uh, I'm not going to hold that against the show, obviously. I'm not going to hold it against any show. It's just, it is stark going from, you know, that level of craft to anything else. But I digress. <clears throat> so, moving on. It, real quick, real quick, actually, one last thing. I can't actually show you this properly, but if you ever feel the mood to see how far the Clone Horse has gone, go watch the first episode sometime. You know, the one about Yoda and that stupid canyon, which has bad... everything? Or, oh god, yeah, or the movie? And I really put that into quote-unquote. And then go immediately to this, right? <laughs> like, just... Oh, man. I actually am one of those weird people who really enjoys the aesthetic of the Clone Wars, the pseudo CGI clay thing that they've got going on. And it, that's fine. I'm with that. I enjoy that very, very much. But man, it took them a while to really actually nail how to make that look good. Because early Clone Wars does not look good. <laughs> to say that as nicely as I possibly can. And obviously it's not season seven they figured that out back in like season four or something like that but you get the point oh man anyways <clears throat> so i always you know cgi thunderbirds uh yeah no i agree they they were trying too much to get uh Gennady's, or Gennady's, however you pronounce his name uh style and they really should have just figured out their own style which they did Ironically, they did actually lock in on their own style. No, the weird one for me was going from pretty much directly from Clone Wars to Rebels. That threw me. Getting off topic. I always like these initial quotes at the beginning of these episodes. Embrace others for their differences, for that makes you whole. Which, very thematically appropriate for this episode. Rex lays out, as he's giving the briefing to Anakin and Windu, the very idea of machine learning tactics. It's an interesting concept. It implies a lot. There's a weirdly large amount of world building in such a simple little scene because it implies that an overwhelming majority of the individual tactics, like the on-the-ground tactics, are not being run by a person at all. They're just being run by a bot. Because that's what he describes. He doesn't use the terminology, but what he's describing is machine learning, that the bots watch and adapt specifically to the input they receive, in this case, the tactics and strategies that the clones themselves use. And of course, clones being clones, such fully sentient sapient beings, they can just come up with new uh, ideas and uh, implement them. And that's that's kind of interesting to think about. And I believe it. Because, well, obviously there are some actual tacticians on hand. Think about this entire episode. There was one individual person giving anything approaching real orders the entire time. That was Trench, of course. Nice to see him back, by the way. So, that's it. One person with oversight over what is probably an entire battle group. But doesn't that just sound like the Separatists and their overall approach? I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. If, if that doesn't sound familiar, then just restructure it a little bit and think about any corporate situation ever where the corporations have been firing overhead in order to try and increase profits and make things cheaper. And the, so when something goes wrong... Anyways... <clears throat> This is why people tend to be irritated about the whole AI thing, what's going on here. 
because yeah and yeah no exactly the bad batch this very episode shows that when when they come up with any kind of a new approach they just wrecking ball over vastly superior numbers of, of droids anyways so rex uh, does this whole thing good scene uh, anakin of course senses a disturbance in the force which leads to rex being like no nothing's wrong and i'm a i kept expecting anakin to be like rex I mean, I mean, I mean, sorry, he's not, he's not evil yet. Rex, you just talk to me. You can talk to me, man. And Rex being like, well, you see, sir. But instead he goes and talks to Cody, which actually makes a bit more sense. But, and this is mostly coming from the perspective of later in the episode, I feel like that scene shouldn't have existed. Uh, not the one where he's briefing the Jedis. That's fine. Uh, the one where he talks to Cody. It gives away a little bit too much that probably shouldn't have been. I'll come back to that. So, we go and we meet Clone Force 99. First of all, can I just say, love the name. Um, it's actually a pretty good, nice uh, nice callback to, to 99, who was just kind of an awesome character in Clone Force. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. I also love the paint job. It is... Uh, can I say really quick here? Um, it is very strange going straight from a 44 to a 22. Uh, in terms of analysis. Yeah, never forget 99. He was awesome. Um, so, let me explain what I mean about it. Uh, there's a... It's not really true anymore, but a lot of television still adheres to it, even though they don't have to. Back in the day, there were two types of shows. Well, actually, there were three, but the third type doesn't matter. So, two types of shows, right? There were 22s, and there were 44s. So named for how long the runtime of a specific episode would be. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of wiggle room in both directions, but that's the format. You've got 22 minutes of time to fill or 44 minutes of time to fill. You're probably thinking, why that? Well, that's easy. It's because it's a half an hour and an hour. All that extra time, that's the ad time. It's why ad breaks are usually built into a lot of shows. If you've ever sat down and watched Star Trek now without the ad breaks, it probably looks a little weird to the modern eye, to, to more modern television uh, design philosophy, because you'll notice there's no ad breaks in this episode. Of course there aren't. It wasn't designed with ads in mind, but it's still a 22. And that's sort of my overall point, is they're still adherent to the general format, even if the reason for doing so has long since faded away. Oh, absolutely, Zacta, by a huge amount. I mean, again, as uh, somebody mentioned earlier, going just from 60... Uh, Season 6 to Season 7 was a huge gap, a huge, huge jump forward. But yeah, no, exactly Dark Ray. The 22 and the 44s are long since outdated concepts, but a lot of shows still adhere to it. I mean, even the show we were just watching, which is Arcane, is a 44. It's like 42 or 45 or 48, but still, it's still a 44, right? It's still that format of television. Um, I, I, I'm sure there's reasons for that other than just tradition and inertia, or I guess momentum. But the reason I was bringing all this up uh, is that it's really strange going straight from analyzing a 44, Arcane, to analyzing a 22, which is Clone Wars. Because by necessity, a 22 has to have much faster pacing. The tempo has to go more, and they have to have more density or just be a worse show. Obviously, they could just, they could just suck. But if they're trying to be a good show, they have to cram a whole lot more in to a much smaller amount of space. And so the episode just kind of goes. You notice that? The pacing of this episode is nonstop, and there's no moments where they could just take a second and breathe and allow a character scene to sit or an establishing shot to sit or whatever, right? And it's just interesting to see that because, once again, doing immediate contrast to something like, say, Arcane, Arcane has several long sections at several points where, after the pacing has intended, there's this nice, long breather period. And then it starts to pick up again. This episode still has good pacing, don't mistake me. It's just jarring going back from the two. Anyways, that's all I wanted to talk about. Moving on. So, we establish the Bad Batch. We have Wrecker, who is our Barbarian. We have Tech, who's the support. Hunter, who's the Ranger. And Crosshair, who's the Sniper. Okay, I'm with it, I'm with it. Uh, we also use the next several scenes, an exposition scene, an action scene, and a recovery scene, all specifically to establish the Bad Batch. This is all fairly formulaic, but as I was just finished talking about yesterday, formulas are not 
necessarily bad. This actually does a pretty good job of quickly and efficiently establishing not just their roles, you know, what they're good at, their class, for lack of a better way to put it, but also their personalities. Yeah, they also look at, I like the visual distinction. You can tell immediately which one's which. And you'll notice they're also voiced a little bit differently too, which adds another bit of variety to it. Big thumbs up on that. Um, we see that uh, Crosshair is far more elitist than the others and far more trigger happy, ironically. Even more so, like you'd think the big guy is the angry guy, but no, it's actually Crosshair. Which actually makes sense because Crosshair is probably the one who's the taut string, right? Pulled just a little bit too taut. He's the one who instigates three of the three fights between the clones throughout the course of this episode. Uh, he's also extremely observant and picks up on things like that. Then we go over to uh, Tech. Tech is fascinating. Oh, God, D. Bradley Baker is so amazing. Um, Tech is interesting because he's, he's the geek, right? Except you normally expect the geek archetype to be the kind of person who's introverted and shy and, and doesn't want anybody to pay attention to him. But no, no, Tech is extremely outspoken, extremely outgoing. Um, I hate to use the word extroverted because actually, it's actually an inaccurate use of the word, but you know what I mean, right? He's just flinging that information out there, constantly trying to be involved in every other conversation, which is great, actually. And yeah, I was actually about to say, you can see why I would relate to Tech personally, because that's a lot more my, tend of, my tendency towards personality. So Tech's awesome. We've got two interesting characters so far. Then we move on to Hunter. Now, Hunter's interesting in that they didn't do much with Hunter yet. I'm going to hold off on any kind of... I swear this is on random. I'm going to hold off on any real judgment on Hunter. They just they just didn't use Hunter that much in this episode. Um, Hunter's the, the... He's got the senses. But personality-wise, all they really did with Hunter is that he knows how to take charge immediately. Remember when they had their second fight and Hunter immediately is like, All right, chill. You put him down. And they're like, aw. And that's it, right? <laughs> just, yeah, the mediator, right? He's the one... He's probably the reason the Bad Batch works so well together. In fact, if you're paying attention during the second scene of the three I mentioned earlier, he's the one who comes up with the play and helps to execute it because, yeah. So he's probably the equivalent Captain America, the leader type. Something that is extremely invaluable for this kind of a team. And I like them showing that because entirely too often fiction tends to forget you need a team leader for a team, generally speaking, right? So... 100%. Uh, yeah, what's his what's his special power? He can put up with the other three. <laughs> and then we move on, of course, to Wrecker. Wrecker's uh, fascinating because you'd think Wrecker's the, you know, oh, I'll kill you, Hulk smash. But actually, Wrecker's just having a good time. Wrecker's just having fun, right? Like, that that's his shtick. <laughs> like, the big laughing guy, I believe, is the name for that particular trope or something, something along those lines. Um, yeah, he's also the explosives expert and the tank and the heavy. So, all right, I'm with it. So we've got an interesting crew and some good establishment. And again, they use their scenes smartly. This is, forgive me, for, for, forgive me for being boring and talking about things like scene construction. But one of the things I love here is that again, each of the upcoming scenes, all three of them, is designed to help exposit. And they do so by keeping the action and the plot moving forward. None of these scenes are dull, dry exposition. Because just picture that, right? In a bad show, picture this. Picture Wrecker walking out and being like, hey, hey. And then, you know, boring man turns to the camera. I mean, I mean to Rex and says, this is Wrecker. As you know, Wrecker is someone who is very boisterous in his demeanor. He likes to have a good time, but he can take the hits and dish them out when needed. And like, you, you get it, right? Like the, 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 the slow, dry, let me tell you the characters characterization scene that bad films and bad shows tend to live and breathe. Ugh. And yeah, early Clone Wars would have done exactly that. You're exactly right. It's it, it, fiction, especially non-interactive fiction in general, just has this love affair with narration. And ugh. moving on. So uh, then they have this wonderful counter-strike against the Chaff Company, which is simple but very fun action. And once again, shows how well the Bad Batch works in a group. That's probably the best overall uh, showcasing of how they work in a group. 
Hunter makes the call, Wrecker provides cover, Tech provides the grenades and extremely precise directions, which Crosshair can immediately follow through on. I was paying attention to the animation, and they did this very smartly. Because what they could have done is they could have just made Crosshair a really, really good shot. And we would have believed that, right? He's a clone sniper, for God's sakes. But instead, what's really cool is he throws, you know, uh, Tech throws the, the EMP grenade, and Crosshair goes right to where it will be. Not tracking it where it is, but where it will be. And then he takes the shot. Which makes sense, right? That's exactly the whole point of calling out the specific mark and vector as he's tossing it. And it's just, it's a really, really minor thing. But it's a nice way to showcase uh, showcase how well they work together. So, then we see Trench. I already mentioned him. I uh, thought I spotted him early in the episode and I was right. And Trench is like, oh, I am very evil. <laughs> also, in addition to that... I have no brain. <laughs> we move on. Trench is a little bit of a eh here. So we start to see some of that rivalry, and I believe this... I can't remember if this is the second or third fight. I've actually lost track at this point. Um, the Wrecker literally picks up a guy by his neck. Although, based on his reaction, he might have just been having fun with it and not actually trying to, to hurt him. Anyways, Hunter brings it together. But what this scene is actually about, weirdly enough is starting our next <laughs> starting our next overall uh, character bit because we've spent this entire time which is most of the episode at this point establishing the bad batch but this is an episode centered around Rex so we need to start establishing Rex and I do like how the episode doesn't assume you know who Rex is or the significance of him as a character or the fact that he's totally in return of the Jedi <laughs> sorry sorry Instead, we have to start establishing Rex. So, okay, Rex is like, all right, let's get this plan going. We have to do this. And he, he's the one who's kind of pushing this. He's also kind of the one who's trying to... Uh... He's, he's the reason they know what's going on to begin with. Let, let me put it to you that way. But also, he's more than willing to roll with it. Now, it's not like the clones in general are particularly rigid, but I do like how, once again, even if you have no familiar with <laughs> familiarity with the franchise or the Clone Wars or anything, you still can tell that Rex is someone who can roll with the punches better, like a good frontline commander should. He also has absolutely no problems, now that he's seen the Bad Batch in an action, working with them. As in working with their specific talents and their specific style. And I was actually about to say, it wouldn't surprise me if Rex is at least in part the way he is because his primary Jedi commander is freaking Anakin. So, yeah. Thumbs up on continuing to characterize and showcase Rex. <sighs> so, I'm going to go ahead and admit something here. I'm not a big fan of member berries, but... Whether or not it is that, or whether it's a callback, or a nostalgia thing, or fan service, well, it the only thing that matters there, the only variance about that, is whether or not it's good. The difference between something that's member berries and something that's, you know, uh, fan service is only the quality of the execution. So, for those of you, I guess I just realized I should explain what I'm talking about. I'm sorry. I'm, ta I'm stealing the word from South Park. The idea of member berries is, hey, you member? Remember this thing? Remember this thing from from the show, from the game, from the book? Remember this thing? And it just it, it it it's not good, to put it simply. It's the kind of thing that actually comes across as a bit insulting. But of course, whether it works or whether it doesn't work is probably going to depend on the individual. So there's a lot of that, right? Um, but then fan service is when you do it and do a good job of it. So whether it lands or not depends entirely on the individual. I mention all of this because one of the the bits of fan service that actually worked for me pretty well was the two droids. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. Maybe it's another drill. I I'll admit it. They got me with that one. That was a nice cut. And yeah, Star Wars. <sighs> Star Wars lends itself way too hard onto member berries. Um, so what happens? I actually don't have many thoughts left. This is going to be a relatively short uh, streamination. It's 22, right? 
uh, fairly well choreographed, uh, fairly well blocked action sequence with little tidbits here and there of good humor as they're going through it. And yeah, I was just about to say, there's an attack coming! Whip! And then his head's blown off. I feel so bad for the B1s. I don't. I, I talked about this when I was doing the Clone Wars Mini Nations. I don't remember exactly when the B1s just became comic relief, but they have never recovered from that slot. They have never been anything other than something to be laughed at while they die horribly ever since. <laughs> you ever, you ever feel bad for the B ones? I mean, even as far back as Episode One, which was the beginning of the B ones, they were still like. You remember that bit? You know, where, where, where are you taking them to Coruscant? You remember that scene? That's way back at the beginning there. Anyways, so well choreographed, well blocked out action sequence. They just run over the cyber center, just smash through the monastery or the monastery. That's what I get for reading chat and reading my notes at the same time, smashing over the cyber center. And they also interspe intersperse the action with little plot beats. I've already mentioned this. This, this is one of the only bits of the episode that doesn't work for me. Because the moment they're like, where's the signal coming from? Well, it's not a, it's not a program. It's a signal. And I'm like, oh, it's Echo. Of course it's Echo, right? Like, and, and of course I know that because you already called that out at the beginning of the episode. And this is my point that I was making earlier. If they had just ejected the scene earlier with Cody and Rex, this could have been a moment, right? This could have been a... Instead, it's just, eh. It's just something that's being, uh, that, that's just a confirmation. Everyone's like, oh my god, it can't be. It can't be the very thing that I myself mentioned earlier in the episode. And it's it's the one th scene that just falls completely flat. And it's a sh damn shame because I'm looking at it like, this could have worked. This could have actually, like, huh? And yeah, if you actually follow the franchise as a whole, knowing who Echo is, knowing knowing what happened to him, this should have been a, wait kind of a moment like this should have been a moment and instead it's just eh. so that sucks and it, it I, I don't have anything else to add to that uh, and and then the episode ends because this is only a 22 and we this is a four-parter apparently I did I did a little looking into that so we're gonna try and at least cover all four episodes today <laughs> probably who Thor has been seven years and five months since season six came out <laughs> And longer than that since the Echo incident. I don't know exactly when that happened. I'd have to I'd have to look that up. Uh, well, that makes sense. It's 12 episodes. Uh, but anyways, so... Pretty good, actually. I Obviously, it's not at the level of Arcane. But that doesn't mean this isn't a good episode. And I didn't enjoy myself for almost the entire episode. Good action, good character, good utilization, good pacing, good tempo... Great voice acting, fantastic animation, excellent visual design. Really, the only thing I think that drags this down is the the stumbling block of the Echo thing, which I mentioned earlier. And I know what you're going to say, but la, you're dumb. And you're right, I am very dumb, but I'm still going to ding the episode for that. So, what are we thinking for color here? So announcement is an is an independent episode. That's strange. Um so as a reminder, for those of you blue, that's pretty bad, Zacta. Um I I can't hmm, I feel like I'm leaning towards orange here personally. Because I, because of the flaw I just mentioned, honestly. I feel it's just such a weird dagger. That, that ruins an entire sequence of the episode. Um, but for those of you not aware how the color system... So, two things. First of all, um, if you type... Actually, three things. First of all, if you type exclamation mark streamination or exclamation mark streaminations in chat, you'll get a link to the spreadsheet where I'm keeping track of all this fun stuff. Um, second of all... Hmm, the... If you type exclamation mark guess... If you feel like it, you know, if you, just for fun, uh, you can go ahead and participate in the guessing game where we're guessing exactly how well we think a particular show will score. 
And you probably think, well, how do you determine the score? Well, it's pretty simple. So Lamentations are black. Then it goes blue, green, yellow, orange, red, purple. Okay, that's the colors. And I obviously tend to think of this in terms of uh, in terms of color. What it boils down to is the numerical score. And as you're seeing, I'm keeping track of the maximum possible score as well as the current total running score of any given episode, or excuse me, any given show up there in the upper right of the spreadsheet. So you can put in a guess for where you think a specific show will line up towards the end, and we'll, you know, if you win, you get to put it, you put interest towards something, it's up to you. Anyways, so having said that, I see several people saying red. I just I can't I can't bring myself to agree that this is a red. I feel like this is an orange. I feel like this is damn good. And there's a lot of great stuff on display here, but that's what orange means by pretty much by definition. Um it means it's it's good. It means it's some damn good stuff that I enjoyed quite a bit. Yeah, like, like reddish orange. That's the problem when you only have six points. This is one of the reasons I like my actual review system. Not that I have time for that. I think I think I think I'm gonna agree with uh, myself. I'm going to go ahead and give that orange. We're going to update this to that. Oh, this could have been even better. And it could, oh, whew. What's going to be funny is we're going to see if it does go that way. we got three more episodes to go through in order to move forwards. Um, I don't know. That's just my take on it. And granted, I obviously have a little bit of more experience with what, what qualifies here. But either way, this is um, this is some good stuff. And I'm definitely, like, I think I will say, despite the misstep, one of the things I will absolutely give the episode is it it, it it gets me interested, right? It's an effective hook. It's the kind of thing that makes me want to watch the second episode to see what's going to happen next. I want to see more of, I want to see more of the, the Bad Batch themselves. I want to see more of Rex, and I want to see what the hell they're doing with Echo, right? So, yeah, good hook. Good opener for a new season. Good opener for the show coming back on air. Hell yes. Uh, here I'll just I'll just do it. Here's as. There you go. Because I know streaminations is not the most intuitive thing to type, but there it is. There's the sheet. Um, this is also for those of you who are still new to the current format of Streaminations. This is kind of how we're keeping track of what episodes are coming up and what episodes we're currently working on. So obviously Arcane is its own thing. Uh, that's always on Saturdays. So for the rest of the week, we're over here on... Um, excuse me, on the rest of the shows. So it's going to go from left to right, Clone Wars, and or Mandalorian, Cyberpunk, Donkey Kong, and then we're going to go down in order. So... You can tell at a glance, because Distant Echo, Season 7, Episode 2, is not colored, that's going to be the next episode. So, like, if three days from now, you're like, ah, oh, I wonder what that lore runner's up to, and you happen to, like, like you happen to just pop in, you could see, I'll just use a random example here, like, pretend that Andor has just been doing terrible and it's all greens, but you could see immediately, oh, well, because all that's filled up, I know now, immediately, that he's on Season 1, Episode 7 of Andor. Make sense? Anyways. That's the idea. I will, of course, be trying to keep up to date on all of the various methods and metrics that I'm using to try and keep people up to date on this, because I know this is a little bit slip slipshod, but this is the compromise. Now, uh, I don't actually have anything else to do. I'm just going to go and I'm going to watch episode two. So I will see you all in about 30 minutes.